Systems Enquiry is instituted by... It says the church does not take responsibility for the conduct of its priests. There is no vicarious liability. Explosive claims of a systematic cover-up. Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox says the Catholic Church in The Hunter has silenced victims of child sexual abuse, hindered police investigations and destroyed evidence. It's a cover-up he alleges is ongoing. I've got no reason to think that anything has changed. There's, uh, you know, this has been going on uh, not just for years, not just for decades, but probably for centuries. All I'm saying is I'm aware that there are currently uh, some matters that have been submitted to the DPP. He says the church lied about not knowing the whereabouts of priests who were under investigation and claims past Bishop Leo Clark refused to report child abuse to detectives after victims confided in him. Current Bishop William Wright has slammed Mr Fox's allegations, claiming it's wrong to suggest any current cover-ups within the church. He is speaking now as if these things are happening on a daily basis now as we speak. Now, the fact of the matter is now in this diocese, Every allegation of criminal conduct against a priest or a diocesan employee is reported to the police. This afternoon, the Premier announced a special commission of inquiry into the matter. Peter Fox has come forward with allegations. Uh, they deserve to be tested uh, and Margaret Keneen is the right person to do it. Mr Fox has renewed his plea for a royal commission. Like the Anglican bishop I saw uh, only this week, turned around and said, yes, let's have a royal commission. Um, I'm in support of it. Um, why am I hearing from the Catholic Bishop that we don't need a, a, a Royal Commission, that uh, everything's OK? If I honestly thought it was a matter of public interest for the protection of children now, uh, I'd, I'd back it. Independent MP Tony Windsor today took his plight for a nationwide inquiry to the PM. To leave it any longer uh, is saying to people that have had these crimes perpetrated upon them and the perpetrators of the crimes that, uh, uh, that this is acceptable in our community. It's not and never should have been. The New England MP says Premier Barry O'Farrell's decision to limit a New South Wales inquiry to a police investigation of pedophile priests in the Hunter Valley makes a mockery of victims statewide. And there's a lack of trust there at the moment and that needs to be done. And I think at the national level is the only way you could achieve that level of trust. Victims, it's bittersweet. Thinking, are we ever going to make this happen? and then to finally hear it, it was just an incredible moment. Peter Gogarty was abused as a young boy by notorious pedophile priest Jim Fletcher. The institutions that have let this happen to innocent kids are now being go uh, you know, going to be asked to explain themselves. How did they let that happen? Louis Perona's son John took his own life in July. He'd been grappling with the pain of being abused by a hunter priest in the 1970s. People who cover up sexual crimes, sexual abuse of crimes, don't seem to think it's serious. Well, they're wrong. They're about to find out that they're very wrong. Anglican Bishop Brian Farron says a royal commission is essential. Catholic Bishop Bill Wright also welcomes it, but admits he's worried what it will uncover. Yeah, look, I think there'll be some embarrassing stuff that'll come out. Hunter detective Peter Fox has been hailed by many as a hero for speaking out. Peter Fitzsimons, the... Uh, the uh, radio DJ from down here uh, made the comment, um, uh, evil flourishes when good men do nothing. I'm just full of praise and admiration for that man. And I think he's genuinely been the last shove to make this happen. A historic day for Peter Fox and victims of child abuse. It's uh, been a long time coming, it's been six months, so uh, we're well and truly ready now, of course. The Detective Chief Inspector was the first witness to appear at the Special Commission of Inquiry following his explosive allegations last year. It's all about uh, getting to the truth and that's what the Commission's all about. The next two weeks will focus on the circumstances leading to why the then Commander Max Mitchell directed Peter Fox to cease investigations into alleged child sexual abuse in the Catholic Diocese of Maitland, Newcastle, involving Father Dennis McAlinden and Father James Fletcher and an alleged pedophile ring with in the church. Detective Chief Inspector Fox perceives that he was removed from any investigative role relating to child sexual abuse matters within the Catholic Church. 
Commissioner Margaret Keneen SC heard that Peter Fox observed collusion, with Father Fletcher warned by the church that he was under investigation. It gave Fletcher full knowledge of the complaint and the victim, prompting Peter Fox to consider charging Bishop Michael Malone with hindering a police investigation. But this didn't occur. Peter Fox also told the Commission that former colleague Troy Grant, who was investigating child sexual abuse within the church, was highly critical of senior police in Newcastle, who deliberately hindered his investigations by giving him extra work. He alleges Mr Grant referred to these officers as the Catholic Mafia, police aligned to the Catholic Church. The Commission also heard Detective Chief Inspector Wayne Humphrey and Superintendent Charles Haggett allegedly went through Peter Fox's office while he was on leave, searching for documents relating to the investigation. 18 witnesses will be called over the next two weeks, including 13 current and former senior police officers and Assistant Commissioner Carleen York. People in high places knew what was going on with the Catholic Church and I think it's fantastic that the whole nation's attention is being focused on this and, as I said, no child should ever be put in this predicament. A second round of public hearings will be held in June and July, focusing further on the Catholic Church and whether it hindered or obstructed police investigations. Hand in hand with his wife, Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox facing another tough day of questioning in an inquiry he sparked. At the centre of today's questioning, a meeting in December 2010 which Mr Fox described as sinister when the then Superintendent Max Mitchell ordered him to hand over every statement and related document to his investigation, not to contact any witnesses and directed him not to speak to the media, effectively to stop investigating the matter. Mr Fox admitted he breached some of those directions just hours later. One of those breaches, an email to Herald reporter Joanne McCarthy, where he shared confidential police information. He told the inquiry the reporter provided most of the witnesses and cutting her out of the investigation would have been corrupt. The detective chief inspector went on to describe Strike Force Lantel as a sham that was, in his opinion, set up to fail. Mr Fox will continue giving evidence tomorrow. Victim support groups are hanging on every word of the inquiry, hoping it's the start of many. There are lots of other areas of New South Wales that have as big a problem as in Newcastle. And there are lots of cases where we need to look into just how police have been investigating. In a statement, he told the inquiry he has no recollection of the term Catholic Mafia being used in any conversations he had with whistleblower Peter Fox. He's obviously uh, mistaken, a uh, conversation attributed to me, which just didn't happen. Detective Chief Inspector Fox had previously told the inquiry the phrase was used to describe those who were out to protect the interests of the church, but later clarified it may have been used in relation to clergy and not police. Troy Grant also told the Commission senior police had only ever assisted with his investigations into child sexual abuse. However, the same could not be said about members of the clergy. There were individuals who acted completely inappropriately, commensurate with any of their pastoral care, I believe have acted illegally. Mr Grant also made explosive claims about the DPP in relation to allegations of a cover-up within the church. I put those that a brief of evidence for that what I believe was alleged illegal activity to the Director of Public Prosecutions who chose not to pursue that prosecution. Decision to this day I disagree with. This afternoon, Peter Fox took to the stand, telling the Commission alleged victims of child sexual abuse were being treated like garbage by officers who were investigating claims of abuse. He went on to say the behaviour of some officers was corrupt and that certain factions within the police were determined for the allegations to not be investigated. Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox faced a fourth day of questioning at the Commission charged with examining the police handling of child sexual abuse allegations in the Maitland Newcastle Catholic Diocese. A tweet made by Mr Fox containing information about police that was subject to a non-publication order landed him in hot water with police counsel who accused him of having a defiance of authority. Wayne Rosa SC went on to accuse Mr Fox of undermining the police strike force set up to investigate claims of of abuse by withholding information he had from alleged victims. Mr Rosa also accused the whistleblower of forwarding his police report to Newcastle Herald journalist Joanne McCarthy for the purpose of gaining publicity. The detective chief inspector admitted he had concealed his contact with Ms McCarthy from senior police. 
Much of this afternoon's questioning centred around information Mr Fox provided to the media and politicians, including Premier Barry O'Farrell. The police barrister questioned why Peter Fox decided to go public with his claims when he knew a strike force had been established. Mr Fox denied undermining investigations, but claims he went to the media in the hope of sparking a royal commission. He told the Commission there were many issues outside Lantel that he believed needed to be looked at, stating what I wanted was a Royal Commission. An outcome delivered shortly after his claims were aired on the ABC. Senior police are expected to front the inquiry tomorrow. Detective Superintendent John Kolitek was the first witness called on day five of the inquiry to answer questions about the police response to claims of a cover-up of sexual abuse by clergy. Documents attached to his statement tendered to the Commission included police correspondence about the allegations. Council representing whistleblower Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox said the document appeared to reflect a lack of urgency surrounding the investigation of the claims, to which Detective Superintendent Kolitek agreed the letter did lack a sense of urgency. However, he strongly refuted previous claims by Mr Fox that the strike force established to investigate the allegations was set up to fail, describing its investigation as quite comprehensive and ultimately a success. Also tended to the court was a police report lodged by Mr Fox to the sex crime squad in 2004 claiming a possible pedophile network within the Catholic clergy. This afternoon, Peter Fox faced his fifth and final day of questioning. Outside court, he said he was relieved this part of the inquiry was over. I feel very drained. I think I'd be lying if I said that uh, I felt any other way. It's, um, it's been a difficult process. Uh, I've still got no reservations whatsoever about uh, what I've said. Detective Inspector Dave Waddell in the witness box for the sixth day of the Special Commission. He was the crime manager at Lake Macquarie during a period of time allegations of clergy sexual abuse were raised. During questioning, Detective Inspector Waddell admitted the allegations weren't matters he would normally attach urgency to, but he did classify the reports as important and serious. He referred the allegations and documents to the Newcastle Local Area Command because that's where the diocese office is located and his command didn't have the resources. He went on to deny claims that he told Newcastle Herald reporter Joanne McCarthy that he didn't envisage any prosecution about allegations of concealment of sexual abuse by the Catholic Church because he hadn't formulated that view and had previously successfully charged someone with that offence. Also taking the stand, Inspector Dave Matthews, who told the Commission his Port Stephens command was also too stretched to accommodate the investigation, while former Newcastle Detective Chief Inspector Brad Taylor says he passed the file on to the sex crime squad. The whistleblower at the centre of this inquiry came under fire for use of social media. The Commissioner chastising Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox for tweeting during proceedings, saying it was undignified conduct, advising Mr Fox to listen and digest rather than tweet. Kate Haberfield, NBN. Taking to the witness stand for the first time, Detective Inspector Paul Jacob. He told the inquiry a claim by Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox that Strike Force Landall was a sham was offensive in the extreme and that he felt sorry for those who had invested time into the matters. He told the court Landall may have been a failure down the track, but in no way did he see any suggestion the investigation was set up to fail and blamed the quality of what police had to work with not the way police worked. He spoke about the difficulties for abuse victims to come forward and went on to say officers did what they had to do with resources available and that the matters were historical but not urgent due to the fact the offending priests were dead. He said early in his career he couldn't recall investigating historical sexual assault cases and now they are commonplace. The inquiry also heard that a number of police thought communication between Herald journalist Joanne McCarthy and Peter to Fox was a risk to investigations and that it needed to be managed. Former Newcastle Commander Max Mitchell took to the stand late this afternoon and will continue to give evidence tomorrow. Barrister Ian Lloyd QC was hired by the Commission to provide an independent assessment of how Strike Force Lantel was conducted. Lantel was the police strike force set up to investigate claims that clergy within the Maitland Newcastle Diocese concealed cases of child sexual abuse. 
Mr Lloyd's report describes Lantel as thorough and rigorous. During questioning, he told the Commission the report given to the Director of Public Prosecutions was one of the most thorough he's ever seen. The strike force was set up to investigate the claims of four individuals. Subsequently, more came forward, but their complaints did not form part of the investigation. Mr Lloyd said Lantel provided a complex investigation spanning nearly two years, and it realistically could have gone on forever if all subsequent allegations were to become part of it. Mr Lloyd also commended the work of Peter Fox, although he was never included in the strike force. It was his allegations that sparked the commission after the detective turned whistleblower made claims that the Catholic Church was involved in a cover-up and senior police in the Hunter didn't adequately investigate the claims. Assistant Commissioner Max Mitchell also took to the stand today defending the actions of police. He denied claims by Mr Fox that he was told to stop investigating the church, claiming he was not included in Strike Force Lantel because of his close ties with Newcastle Herald journalist Joanne McCarthy, who police suspected was being given information by Mr Fox. Mr Fox has always maintained it was Ms McCarthy's close ties with alleged victims that would have significantly helped police investigations. However, officers were told to cut communications with her. The inquiry resumed today, investigating how police handled complaints of child sex abuse within the Maitland Newcastle Diocese. Newcastle Herald journalist Joanne McCarthy was called as a witness. I'm glad that uh, she's at long last now being able to, uh, to give uh, her version of events. Ms McCarthy had been in close contact with victims and police whistleblower Peter Fox and told the Commission he was pretty keen. Others weren't so keen. She was also angered by the treatment of one victim and admitted that she wasn't wholeheartedly buying into the police investigation. Ms McCarthy added a senior officer contacted her to say that prosecution wasn't the way to go with historical matters and that truth and reconciliation was appropriate. Detective Sergeant Geoffrey Little, who was in charge of the strike force, set up to investigate the alleged abuse was also called as a witness. When asked if anyone discouraged him from speaking to Peter Fox, he answered he was noted as a possible leak. Detective Sergeant Little said he was mortified by comments that Strike Force Lantel was a sham and set up to fail, adding, I wasn't operating in secret and there was no manipulation of the truth. Peter Fox had ridden to glory on a saddle of lies, including that a brief of evidence had been compiled on Bishop Malone. I'm not concerned about those sort of things at all. It's up to the Commission to make their judgment on it. I, I was expecting those sort of things from the start and um, the police force hasn't disappointed me. Journalist Joanne McCarthy arrived for a second day of questioning this morning. The Newcastle Herald report has been central to the inquiry because of her connection to victims and articles she's written on child abuse and alleged covering up within the Catholic Church. Her connection to Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox and what information the pair shared in relation to the crimes has also been closely scrutinised. Council representing the police has previously told the Commission that Peter Fox was thought to be leaking information to Ms McCarthy. In responding to questions from police barrister Wayne Rosa, Ms McCarthy asked to be provided with evidence of any such leaks, saying I'd like to know what information that is because no one has pinned that down yet. Joanne McCarthy's lawyer, Winston Terencini QC, told the Commission the church had essentially protected Dennis McElindon despite knowing about his crimes. The Commission was told the church gave one victim documents which indicated senior clergy knew about sexual abuse within its ranks but did nothing about it. After leaving the witness box, Ms McCarthy expressed her relief that victims are finally getting the vindication they deserve. We're doing this on the back of a Victorian parliamentary inquiry that I think has really exposed to the Australian public the very real differences between what the Catholic Church has said in the past about how it deals with these matters and what it actually has done um, behind the scenes. This afternoon, Detective Chief Inspector Wayne Humphreys took to the stand, choosing to retract elements of his statement relating to Peter Fox, saying he could no longer stand by certain claims. When asked about his response to an application to have Father Dennis McElinden, who was terminally ill, extradited from Western Australia, he said he supported it, adding, I didn't care how sick he was, my priority was getting him before the courts. Detective Inspector Graham Parker also took to the stand to give evidence about his involvement overseeing Strike Force Lantel, which was set 
up to investigate the claims of a church cover-up. The inquiry is examining not only the Catholic Church's response to claims of abuse, but also accusations from Peter Fox that senior police hampered his efforts to investigate the allegations. Detective Inspector Parker told the Commission that Assistant Commissioner Carleen York had requested officers from Newcastle LAC investigate the issues raised by Mr Fox, who maintained he had substantial evidence of a church cover-up. Mr Parker's testimony also included claims that the Detective Chief Inspector was trying to disrupt Strikeforce investigations and was withholding information relating to victims and alleged offenders. When questioned over the prolonged absence of investigating officers on sick leave and the slow progression of the strike force, he told the Commission police were busy with other things, but ultimately the matters were addressed. The first part of the inquiry was examining the circumstances in which whistleblower Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox was asked to cease investigating claims of a cover-up of abuse within the church. Superintendent John Grolton was among the last of the police witnesses called, today giving evidence about his knowledge of events around the time Peter Fox raised his concerns. A major focus of the inquiry has been whether police failed to properly investigate the issues raised. Mr Grolton was being questioned about whether he thought police would conceal information to protect the church when he revealed his own personal experience. The superintendent broke down as he told the commission he was assaulted by a priest at a Catholic school as a child in front of 40 other students, adding any assertion that police would conceal information was fanciful and could not be further from the truth. He also testified that he provided other evidence about abuse brought upon his friends to Strike Force Georgiana, which has so far charged 11 people in relation to more than 400 assaults on more than 100 victims. Chief investigator involved in that strike force, Detective Sergeant Christy Faber, also testified, saying she had never faced any resistance from colleagues during her investigations, adding the concealment of a crime is an offence we investigate to the fullest. She also told the Commission that Peter Fox had warned her her life was in danger from a Catholic mafia operating within the church as payback for her successful convictions of clergy, an assertion thoroughly rejected by Mr Fox's counsel. It's an apology and an admission many victims thought they'd never hear. I wish to make an unreserved apology on behalf of the diocese to all those who have suffered as a result of acts or omissions of members of this diocese in relation to matters before this special commission of inquiry. The comments came during the opening day of the second half of the inquiry, which is examining the extent to which church officials helped or hindered police. Council assisting Julia Lonergan SC detailed claims that senior church officials not only knew of clergy abuse, but actively covered it up. We expect that the evidence gathered by this inquiry will show that the Maitland Newcastle Diocese as an institution had extensive knowledge dating back to the 1950s of the serious risk posed to children by McAlinden. She went on to outline the contents of a letter sent to former Bishop Leo Clark relating to Dennis McAlinden's departure from a local parish. The reason why Father wants to go so very much now is because it will afford a good cover-up for his resigning the parish. There were also claims made about the treatment of victims who came forward. This boy was given penance, apparently for his sin, and being abused. Today he told the Commission that in 2002 the then Bishop of the Maitland Newcastle Catholic Diocese Michael Malone had a conversation with Father James Fletcher regarding a victim who'd come forward to police. Mr Fox said he became aware of the issue after being contacted by the victim's mother who was upset her child's identity had been revealed. Detective Chief Inspector Fox, who later had Fletcher convicted of nine child sex offences, said this tip-off forewarned the priest and he believed it provided the opportunity to destroy evidence. Peter Fox told the inquiry he had a conversation with Bishop Malone about the incident and was far from satisfied with his response because Fletcher was allowed to continue working in contact with children despite the allegation. However, he also admitted that for the most part Bishop Malone was cooperative. Under questioning from counsel assisting it emerged there were several indiscrepancies with evidence given by Peter Fox during private sittings of the commission relating to sensitive elements of child sex abuse investigations. The inaccuracies 
is related to the times and dates in which DCI Fox claimed to have taken important statements and notes as part of his investigations. Today, the Commission heard explosive evidence that it knew of Father Dennis McElindon's actions as early as 1954. Among evidence tendered is a letter from Monsignor Patrick Cotter in 1976 to the then Bishop of the Maitland Newcastle Catholic Diocese, Leo Clark. It followed a meeting with diocesan consultants regarding McElindon and refers to his tendencies to touch young girls. Other documents include separate letters from Bishop Clark to bishops in Papua New Guinea and Western Australia, which also make reference to his behaviour towards children. Detective Inspector Peter Fox told the Commission that while investigating one claim against McElindon, he asked Leo Clark if he knew anything about other potential victims, but was told by the bishop that he couldn't help him. Peter Fox said had Bishop Clark been forthcoming with his knowledge of McElindon's history, it would have opened up a Pandora's box and numerous other avenues of inquiries. Adding if all this had been made available in 2003, it would have required a team of investigators to explore those avenues. The Commission was also told that the Apostolic Nuncio was advised of the problems in 1995. Bishop Clark contacted the Pope's representative in Canberra asking he expedite the defrocking of McElindon. Documents also indicate at the same time Father Brian Lucas was made aware of the issues. Dennis McElindon died in Western Australia 10 years later having never faced justice. Detective Chief Inspector Peter Fox faced another day of examination by Bishop Michael Malone's barrister, Simon Harbin, SC. Much of it surrounded a meeting between DCI Fox and Bishop Malone in 2002 regarding pedophile priest Jim Fletcher, who was under investigation at the time. The detective wanted Fletcher suspended from his parish and put in a diocese office. He told the bishop, I feel he should be removed. I cannot force you, but strongly suggest it, give consideration to it and added today that the safety and welfare of the community needed to take precedence using examples of police and teachers who'd been suspended pending charges. Barrister Simon Harbin pointed out that DCI Fox only used the words give consideration saying therefore Bishop Malone didn't actually refuse to suspend Fletcher. But six weeks later Bishop Malone had doubled the size of Fletcher's parish to include Lochinvar and two more schools due to a shortage of priests. Peter Fox told the Commission that Jim Fletcher should not have been in contact with children, but he was still going into schools, even taking reading classes with individual students. Several documents were tendered to the Commission this morning, which Peter Fox said would have helped his investigation in 2003, including a letter from August 1960 from Father Dennis McAlinden to a young girl, which the detective said amounted to child grooming, and a 1996 letter from the pedophile priest to Bishop Malone disputing claims of relationships over a lengthy period with any child. Proceedings focused on evidence previously given to the Commission by Detective Peter Fox. Council representing the Maitland Newcastle Catholic Diocese, Lachlan Giles, refuted claims from Mr Fox about an encounter between a victim of Father James Fletcher and Father Robert Searle. Mr Fox claims Father Searle made an admission to him that the victim had made claims that clergy was abusing children during a drunken rant outside the Nelson Bay Presbytery. However, in a subsequent police statement, Father Searle made no such admissions. Mr Giles slammed the claim as nonsense before unsuccessfully seeking to have a non-publication order placed on his cross-examination. Counsel assisting the Commission questioned earlier evidence tendered by Mr Fox about claims relating to gay pornography allegedly found by a parishioner at the Lochinvar Presbytery occupied by James Fletcher. Mr Fox told the Commission that the layperson contacted him saying he'd been told by Fletcher that the magazines and videos belonged to the former priest, Father Des Harrigan. The whistleblower also told the Commission he believed the material did in fact belong to Fletcher, despite receiving an admission from Father Harrigan that the pornography was his. The detective went on to defend assertions from Ms Lonergan that he did not take statements from Father Harrigan or the parishioner because it didn't fit with his case theory on Fletcher, despite the possibility the material could have warranted investigation. Father Harrigan's solicitor claims her client never admitted to destroying the material, although Peter Fox maintains he did, saying the only reason he didn't take a formal statement was that he believed the evidence was destroyed. Michael Malone slipped into the special commission this morning for his first day of evidence, avoiding the media throng gathered outside. He took to the stand shortly after lunch and began giving his recollection of events around the time Bishop Leo Clark resigned and he was appointed head of the diocese in mid-1995. 
Under questioning from council assisting Julia Lonergan, Bishop Malone said Bishop Clark's resignation and his subsequent elevation came as a complete shock, adding that he had expected a more solid handover so he could be briefed on any secret documents on priests that he presumed existed. Bishop Malone told the commission that the handover lasted a matter of minutes and then the outgoing leader left like a rocket. But not before pointing out a large briefcase in the corner of his office containing what later emerged as documents outlining abuse allegations against pedophile priest Dennis McElinden. Bishop Malone told the commission that when he asked Bishop Clark what was inside, he responded with, oh well, you'll find out. He said that he also pressed his predecessor on whether there were any skeletons in the closet. The public gallery was the fullest it's been since the commission began. At times, those gathered to hear Michael Malone's evidence gasped as he told the commission what he could and could not remember about his dealings with child abuse allegations within the church. Bishop Malone told the commission that he first became aware of the child abuse allegations against McElinden at a Dean's meeting in 1995 and that a departing instruction from Bishop Clark was that he complete the process of defrocking McElinden on the basis that church officials believed he had a case to answer over abuse claims. Under questioning, Bishop Malone said while he looked at the documents in the briefcase, he never looked at ones detailing abuse allegations held at the diocese office, saying he found it hard to remember exactly what was contained in the documents he did read. Bishop Malone will continue giving no, evidence tomorrow. Kath Landers, NBN News. When asked by counsel assisting Julia Lonergan if he looked at a file on Dennis McAlinden when approached by a woman making sex abuse allegations against the priest, Bishop Malone said, I don't think I did, I accepted her story. He was then asked if he said to the woman at the time, McAlinden has a file so big you could not jump over it. He replied, that sounds like something I would say. Bishop Malone admitted he did look at the file, but when questioned if he did not explore the file because he didn't want to know, Bishop Malone said, no, not because I didn't want to know, it was more the whole area is distasteful. Bishop Malone was also questioned about his actions upon reading the letter by Monsignor Patrick Cotter to his predecessor, Bishop Clark, in which the Monsignor referred to having obtained admissions of pedophilic tendencies from McAlinden. The council assisting the commission asked if it occurred to him to refer the matter to the police. He replied, it didn't occur to me, no. The commission also heard McAlinden once wrote to Bishop Malone and said, if you would advise it, I'd be prepared to go to the police and accuse myself. Bishop Malone said at the time he was torn because some victims didn't want police involved. However, he believes he did make efforts to contact police several years later through the church's professional standards committee. Again the centre of attention, Bishop Michael Malone arrived for his third day of evidence at the Special Commission of Inquiry in Newcastle. Council assisting Julia Lonigan asked the bishop about a provision of the church's canon law, which says secret documents on priests should be destroyed whenever a guilty party has died or ten years have lapsed. She inquired, did you follow that part of the canon? Bishop Malone answered, no, I didn't destroy any documents in my time as bishop. Perhaps I should have, they're all here. When Ms Lonergan later returned to that statement suggesting you made a joke, you said you should have destroyed the documents, he added, only in as far as we might not be in this room now had I destroyed them. Bishop Malone was also questioned about his role in defending the church's reputation. He agreed that he attempted to avoid scandal. As a priest for 50 years and bishop for 20, you're caught up in the whole ethos. And since you are serving the church, there is a tendency naturally to defend the organisation to which you belong. So yes, I was conscious of the fact sexual abuse was impinging upon the stability of the church and I regretted that. And in the early times, I tried to prevent that from causing damage to the church by trying to play it down perhaps a little. When asked if that affected his decision to provide information to police, Bishop Malone said it was an open house and that he would not have deliberately denied police access to documents. He explained that by 2004 he was more transparent and open. I couldn't sit on the fence trying to defend the church and look after victims of sexual abuse. Asked whether there was a resistance to that from fellow priests, he replied, never overt, but I sensed it. There was more a sense of non-cooperation. I think a number of people wanted me to go away, which eventually I did. To be able to ask some questions of 
a recently retired bishop of the Catholic Church, is a very good feeling. Today, Bishop Malone told the inquiry that once the church became aware of questions surrounding Fletcher's behaviour, he told the principal of a school he visited that activities such as reading lessons would need to be curtailed and the principal would need to keep a close eye on him. Mr Gogarty asked, did you check whether that sort of scrutiny was happening, to which the bishop replied, no, I didn't. The issue of when Bishop Malone told the principal came under close scrutiny later in the day when his barrister, William Potter, accused the bishop of falsifying a diary entry he faxed to the Ombudsman in September 2003. Mr Potter put it to Bishop Malone that the pen used to note a meeting with the principal did not match that used to jot down other matters at the time. His client maintains the conversation about Fletcher actually occurred at a later date. At the conclusion of his evidence, the Commissioner asked Bishop Malone if he thought there was a greater proportion of sexual abuse in the Maitland-Newcastle Diocese, and if so, why. The Bishop acknowledged that there was a large volume, but could not explain why that might be the case. The Bishop emerged this afternoon, adding to the apology made earlier in the inquiry by the current head of the Diocese. I welcome his apology and add my own sincere sorrow that any actions of mine may have added to the pain of victims and their families. Father Burston, who was the Vicar General at the Maitland Newcastle Catholic Diocese for a significant period of time during the 90s, was shown the documents, but on numerous occasions said he could not recall the specifics surrounding them. David Kell put it to him that it might be considered inconceivable that he would not remember such a striking and memorable occasion, like the first time he learned of the McElindan allegations, to which Father Burston replied, probably yes, before adding he has problems with his memory in general, citing multiple anaesthetics as the cause. Under further questioning, Father Burston said he had no memory of looking at specific documents relating to McElindon in the diocese's office, nor did he recall an assertion that Bishop Malone had a conversation with him about victims considering a push for criminal charges, saying lots of things may have occurred, but I do not recall. Father Burston also added that he could not remember when he first heard about claims surrounding pedophile priest Father James Fletcher, but later acknowledged it was most likely following a 60 minute story in June 2002. Council assisting asked the father if he was seeing a doctor about his memory problems, to which the priest replied, no. Monsignor Alan Hart faced the Commission of Inquiry for the first time today. Working as Vicar General under former Bishop Leo Clark, he was asked, did you have any conversation with the Bishop regarding Dennis McElinden sexually abusing children? He replied no, adding Bishop Leo was very private. Minutes later, he conceded that he did have a conversation with the Bishop in early 1993, after a victim of McElinden approached him in the hope of stopping the priest from re-offending. McElinden had sexually abused abused her when she was a little girl. She asked me to tell the bishop. The commission was told about a letter from Bishop Clark to McElinden, which read, in light of your health, I hereby confirm your retirement and withdraw your faculties. Asked, was that a coy way to refer to his propensity for abusing children? Alan Hart said, that sounds likely. As McElinden was now deemed sick, he was provided with a food allowance from the Maitland Clergy Sick and Retired Priest Fund. Earlier, the Commission was told Father William Burston's ability as a witness had been compromised after being approached outside the inquiry on Wednesday. His cross-examination was adjourned until next Friday. The Commissioner said by next Friday the stress of the most unfortunate events may well be behind him. I have questioning about his dealings with pedophile priest Dennis McElinden and others mainly in the 1990s. At the time, Father Lucas was part of a special committee charged with dealing with various issues relating to Catholic priests, including child sex abuse claims. He told the inquiry efforts were made to remove suspected pedophiles from active ministry, saying if he's willing to resign, that's a good outcome. However, he conceded it is a problem when he disobeys that direction. Council assisting Julia Lonergan pressed Father Lucas on why police weren't notified of criminal accusations against clergy members. He told the commission he didn't go to police because he didn't want to betray victims. I never felt able to do that, he said, because victims didn't want to go to police. Father Lucas later admitted that the church processes for handling abuse complaints were, in hindsight, perhaps erroneous, adding it may have been better to force victims to go to authorities. 
Documents previously tendered to the Commission indicated Dennis McElind had made admissions of his crimes to Father Lucas. However, he now says he can't recall that, although he accepts it may have happened. The victim's mother, whose name's been suppressed, told the Commission of the extremely hurtful ostracism which escalated once Father Fletcher became aware of a police investigation. It was horrifying that um, they support people in times of death and tragedy, but if it's the priest that comes under question, they don't want to know about it. Inside, she explained, there was a calling of greetings. Suddenly people were in a hurry or disappeared. I felt estranged. She gave examples of eggs being thrown at her house, anonymous phone calls, losing voluntary positions within the parish, even being pushed over by a woman at East Maitland Court. A man I knew quite well in, um, from Dungog Parish rammed a supermarket trolley into my leg. It would have been easier if my son hadn't done anything, but he and us chose not to do that. Outside the commission, she concluded... It surprised me through this whole inquiry. Um, clergy and other witnesses are having tr trouble trying to remember. And I can tell you for sure that victims have a lot of trouble trying to forget. In wrapping up her questioning to Father Brian Lucas, Julia Lonergan asked, I suggest that your evidence that you cannot recollect your meeting with Dennis McAlinden defies belief. He replied, I find that a very hurtful proposition. Father Lucas had admitted that he hadn't taken notes when speaking to pedophile priests. He dodged questions about that today. I really can't engage with you uh, in a question and answer session. But in a written statement he said there was little in way of regulation and we did not appreciate the full impact on victims of such damaging conduct. The Special Commission of Inquiry chaired by Margaret Keneen looked into how clergy from the Maitland Newcastle Diocese handled complaints of sexual abuse by priests Dennis McAlinden and James Fletcher and into claims that Detective Inspector Peter Fox was asked by police to cease investigations of abuse. On the clergy's handling of complaints, the findings are damning. The Commissioner found Bishop Michael Malone failed to take steps to report McAlinden, even though he'd have known the diocese had information that would have assisted police in their investigation, and that information Malone conveyed to police about an abuse victim was late and inaccurate. Margaret Keneen found the failure of diocese officials Patrick Cotter and Bishop Leo Clark in acting on other matters was inexcusable. Detective Inspector Peter Fox, who had been investigating claims of abuse for several years, claimed he was ordered off the investigation and that a Catholic mafia existed within the ranks of police. But the Commissioner found there's no credible evidence to support the notion that senior police were prepared to take steps to ensure that alleged child abuse offences were not properly investigated. The Commission also rejected Peter Fox's assertion that Strike Force Lantel was a sham set up to fail, but did find detectives should have spoken to Peter Fox, who could have helped the investigation. The Commissioner went as far as to say Mr Fox, along with two other witnesses, Father Bill Burston and Monsignor Alan Hart, were found to be unimpressive and or unsatisfactory witnesses. It was an inquiry that uncovered a silent evil. For Peter Gogarty, this premises is where the torment occurred. Yesterday's findings from the Special Commission of Inquiry into how police and the Catholic Church handled complaints of child sexual abuse in the Hunter provided a sense of satisfaction. People in high places in the Catholic Church, particularly in this diocese, certainly knew ab about the activities of Dennis McAlinden and James Fletcher for a long, long time. Three of the four volumes of the report were made public with the other remaining confidential and it's believed criminal charges could be laid against a senior church official as a result. I'm extremely confident that this commission would not have made such a finding unless they were very sure that somebody, and they call it a senior church figure, has known about the crimes of Jim Fletcher for a long time and did nothing about it. Peter, this is where it all happened, um, where Father Fletcher, James Fletcher yep abused you, how does it make you feel? Yeah, look, I, I still get a f funny feeling in the stomach coming to this place. But Mr Gogarty feels part of the report handed down by Commissioner Margaret Keneen, which said that Detective Inspector Peter Fox was an unsatisfactory witness and gave untruthful evidence was disappointing. His frustration at not being able to bring some of these people to account has turned into his feelings sort of boiling over into statements of fact that in the end couldn't be supported. 
Bishop Bill Wright of the Diocese of Maitland, Newcastle, will hold a press conference to respond to the report on Tuesday. Peter, do you still believe in God? No, I don't, Michael. I, I have a funny view about religion, but I can't believe that there's a God who would let the things happen in this world that are going on take place. The explosive findings were a tough read for the Catholic Church. For me and others in this diocese, it is a bitter experience to read the report. The Special Commission of Inquiry brought into question the inactions of up to six senior members of the Maitland Newcastle Diocese for failing to report child sexual abuse. It's believed one senior church official could face possible prosecution. It, it's, it's just, that's just an appalling story. You know, sadly, uh, I've been caught up in, in this stuff, as you say, uh, on um, in various ways. The inquiry lasted 92 days, during which time 161 victims, their families and other witnesses were called to give evidence. It was revealed that the Catholic Church covered up sexual child abuse and it shocked the bishop. Some of the specific detail in this report is news to me. In regard to the bishop of the day having some knowledge of uh, McAlinden's offending in, in, back in the 60s. And as far as future serious matters within the church are concerned. My child protection people, the specialists in the diocese, are analysing the report for any additional lessons we can learn to improve our practices in protecting children. Nothing at this point has jumped off the page at me. Meanwhile, police have again urged anyone with information about clergy sex abuse to still come forward. Yeah, we really encourage uh, victims of child sexual abuse to come forward and report that to the police. We'll take it very, very seriously. And we also encourage them to tell their story to the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission arrives in Newcastle tomorrow and the evidence it will hear is expected to be confronting, to say the least. I think it will be a shock for the broader community about you know, what they will learn, uh, but certainly for people who've been directly affected, uh, people who've already come forward, their wounds will be reopened. Helen Kevers is the Director of Just Is, an organisation that supports the clergy abused network. Her hopes for these hearings are simple. I'm hoping that we get clarity, that we get answers about exactly what has happened. Ms Kevers also wants to see acceptance of the abuse that has happened and support for those affected. Talk to somebody, talk to anybody. Uh, the community is ready to listen, the commission is ready to listen and people will believe you. The hearings, the 42nd and 43rd of this Royal Commission will be held here at Newcastle Courthouse. The first will focus on the Anglican Diocese of Newcastle. 30 witnesses are expected to give evidence. Former Lord Mayor John McNaughton will take the stand, as will a number of former bishops, while current Bishop Greg Thompson is scheduled last on the witness list. A raw display of emotion, wounded and still very broken. The pain of years of abuse from within the Anglican Church finally laid out bare. <laughs> abuse survivor Paul Gray, the first to give evidence at the sixth public hearing relating to the Anglican Church, harrowing details of repeated abuse at the hands of his godfather, Anglican priest Peter Rushton, who died in 2007 beginning from the age of 10 on a weekly to fortnightly basis. On many of these occasions, Father Peter would cut my back with a small knife and spear my blood on my back. And I would, I would like to add there that that was actually symbolic of the blood of Christ. He told of the continuing abuse at St Albans Boys' Home in the Hunter Valley. While at St Albans, I would usually be locked in the room at the end of the hall, sometimes for hours at a time, and different men would visit me in the room <laughs> and either rape me or make me perform oral sex on them. Describing his desperate attempts to escape. I was chased by two men. edge of the cliff and I hid in the bushes. After I was dragged from the bushes, I was raped by the two men. And while I'd be raped, I could hear another boy screaming. 
Fellow survivor Philip DeMond told the Commission of his abuse at the hands of Father James Brown, who's currently in jail convicted of abusing 20 boys. I felt scared and wet myself. I got out of bed freaking out at him and tried to lock myself in the bathroom. The hearings will determine whether there was a culture within the diocese which enabled abuse to flourish. It is anticipated that there will be evidence that on various occasions over the years, officials within the diocese were made aware of suspicions that Rushton and Brown were sexually abusing boys. Appearing via video link, former bishop Alfred Holland, adamant he was never told during his 15 years at the helm of the Newcastle Anglican Diocese that one of his own was abusing children. You say you have no memory of any fellow priest making an allegation of that nature about Father Rushton. No, that's right. Is that the truth, Bishop Holland? It is the truth. It is the truth. He told the Commission that at the time he considered Peter Rushton to be competent and well respected and even promoted him to Maitland Archdeacon. Bishop Holland resolution his denial even when questioned over an alleged phone call he made to a concerned church volunteer. Do you deny that that telephone call happened or do you have no recollection that that telephone call happened? Ha I deny that it happened. Well, I suggest to you that it did and you are not telling the truth to this commission. I'm very sorry, you're wrong. I am telling the truth. Church whistleblower Reverend Roger Dyer also took the stand, telling the commission he was bullied and intimidated for raising sex abuse allegations against Rushton. I was phoned by John Cleary, the diocesan business manager, and he told me that Plans were afoot to have me removed. Well, commission. Well, it's plain in your time in Newcastle there was abusive behaviour occurring, wasn't it? Yes, yes. But you say you didn't know anything about it. Certainly, it was, certainly I was not, not aware at all um, of what some of the issues that have now been revealed by this commission. A senior official within the church, the commission heard Bishop Appleby was none the wiser when it came to abuse by the clergy. Bishop Appleby denied being made aware of allegations of child abuse from within the Anglican Diocese by victims themselves and also denied knowledge of the abuse perpetrated by Peter Rushton, saying he wished he'd been made aware of the abhorrent and evil behaviour so he could take decisive action. The bishop was also quizzed about being asked to deal with a disturbance at a Wyong church. You weren't curious as to what sort of disturbance it was? I don't believe I pursued that, no. Why? Hmm. Maybe with hindsight. Earlier, former Archdeacon Colvin Ford made startling allegations about Rushton. He was well protected by a group I called the Gang of Three, uh, Dean Graham Lawrence, Archdeacon Bruce Hoare and Peter Mitchell. He detailed the discovery of hundreds of pornographic videos belonging to Rushton found by removalists and destroyed by the church. He needed to use a 44 gallon drum in order to get rid of them. He also told me that the covers of some of the videos depicted men and boys which I took to mean primary school age children. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. St John's College, a place of unimaginable pain. Today the Royal Commission heard evidence of how a trainee priest at the college groomed and sexually abused a vulnerable teenage boy. I felt very confused and embarrassed. I felt like this, it was not really happening. I did not say anything. When Ian stopped, he might have asked if I was OK and started talking like nothing had happened. The witness, known only as CKU, told the Commission he lived at the Morpeth College in the late 90s while his mother trained there to be a priest. At the age of 14, he was befriended by Ian Barrick, who abused him three to four times a week. As a child being abused, I felt trapped. You are constantly being manipulated. You get to the point where you believe what is being done to you is, is good and what they are doing is right. 
His mother also gave evidence, describing St John's College as a devil's playground. While I lived on campus, I heard a lot of rumours going around about certain people and certain priests concerning homosexual activity happening amongst people on campus and about certain priests who might fancy little boys. Earlier, Newcastle's former assistant Anglican bishop took the stand for a second day. His knowledge of clergy abuse, again, the focus of intense questioning. Appleby, let me ask you squarely, did you turn a blind eye to what was going on with Stephen Gray? No, no. Did you turn a blind eye to allegations that CKZ had been assaulted by James Brown? Definitely not, because I, did, I was not aware of that. Enduring a full day of sustained and intense questioning at the Royal Commission... How are you feeling, Mr Allen? Keith Allen emerged late this afternoon, not necessarily unscathed. Allen advised that the church had influence over the police up until recent years, and often things were dealt with by a wink and a nudge. Fending off allegation after allegation made by Anglican Diocese business manager John Cleary, who claimed during a 2015 Anglican meeting, Allen described then Bishop Roger Herft was the biggest concern for the diocese because of his handling of the brown envelopes. So you say there's one occasion when you remember there was an allegation of sexual assault of a child by a priest recorded in a brown paper envelope. Is that right? Yes. Roger Herft wasn't the only one Alan was concerned about, according to Mr Cleary. Alan advised that Graham Lawrence would be a focus of the police and the Royal Commission and that Lawrence would bring others down. As for what, he wouldn't say. Now, Mr Alan, you're giving evidence on your oath before the Royal Commission. Are you aware in any way, shape or form of allegations being made against Graham Lawrence in relation to sexual improprieties against children, excluding the incident that led to his defrocking? No. Is that the truth, Mr Allen? Yes. Mr Allen also admitted to destroying the resignation letter of convicted pedophile Stephen Gray, replacing it with a new one dated February 11, 1990 one day before Gray was charged with abusing a 14-year-old boy on the Central Coast. Once a prominent and powerful member of the Anglican Church, Dean Graham Lawrence is now fending off allegations of child sexual abuse. I uh, stroked Goyette's leg under the table and then after dinner we ended up ha having a three-way sex together. And by that you mean that you, Graham Lawrence and Greg Goyette were involved? That's correct, yeah. The accusations made by a witness known as CKH on the sixth day of the Royal Commission. Age 17 at the time, CKH also detailed another alleged incident one year earlier. He claims also involved Lawrence. He had asked to see my confirmation certificate given that he had confirmed me and then he approached me took my hand and put it against his trousers. He told the commission he was astounded. The alleged offenders thought it was OK to take responsibility for his sexual awakening and development when they had been entrusted with his pastoral care. Earlier, Keith Allen was excused after being grilled for three days, maintaining he knew no details about child sexual assaults contained in brown envelopes, despite the commission being shown those envelopes. And I suggest to you that your evidence that you did not discuss either the name of the priest concerned, the name of the parish or the name of the complainant is absolute nonsense. That's not true. Mr Allen also spoke of his involvement in discussions with other members of the diocese surrounding plans to overthrow Director of Professional Standards Michael Elliott. When questioned whether those discussions centred around people who are alleged to have committed misconduct, Mr Allen responded with yes. 
Peter Mitchell emerging from Newcastle Court following an intense day of questioning at the Royal Commission. The former Dyson Registrar is accused of protecting a priest at the centre of child abuse allegations. I want to suggest that you, sir, would be the mould of person who might, who might fraudulently record material in a register to protect your friend. Absolutely untrue. The Commission heard the priest, known as CKC, was charged in 1991, but his trial was abandoned when a church document was presented showing the alleged offences couldn't have been committed when they were said to. Mr Mitchell, at any time prior to this document being provided to the DPP, did you make any alterations to this document? Certainly not. Are you sure about that? Quite positive. The senior church official did admit to providing information to solicitor Keith Allen without a subpoena. Earlier, the commission heard a removalist discovered child pornography while packing the belongings of pedophile priest Peter Rushton. Were you ever asked to sign any sort of document or statement or what? I was, yes. What, what were you asked to sign? Um, I'm pretty sure it was... Uh something to the events where I wasn't allowed to talk about it. Um, I was told that the church knew that he was gay and I wasn't allowed to say anything to anyone. You say that you believe you've endured a high level of interference in most aspects of your work. This has included practices such as isolation, bullying, policy changes, under-resourcing, reviews, oversight, personal attack and lack of support. That's true. He went on to say his family home and car had been vandalised, the windows to his kids' bedroom broken and his family dog went missing, he suspects, because of his work. Mr Elliott also spoke of how DICE's protocol was amended in 2012 so that decisions made by the Professional Standards Board were dealt with privately. Before that, they were public knowledge. I thought it was catastrophic. And why was that? I felt it was uh, would be a significantly abusive process for a complainant. During a cross-examination that at times bordered on theatrical, the basis of Mr Elliott's report into the use of the now infamous brown envelopes was scrutinised. I mean, you're just grasping really, aren't you, to cover up that you don't know anything other than these documents? No. It extended late enough into the afternoon that Mr Herf wasn't called to the stand he will be after Mr Elliott finishes giving evidence tomorrow morning. He's one of Australia's most senior Anglicans. The Archbishop of Perth, Roger Herft, today admitting he failed to act on allegations against notorious pedophile priest Peter Rushton. Did you drop the ball with Peter Rushton? When I look back on, on what has happened, I've asked myself a number of times why was I not more alert? Why weren't the people around me more alert? I struggle to find an answer for that, but I agree with you that at that particular point of time, I should have acted more effectively and well, and I did not. On day nine of the Royal Commission, Archbishop Herft was quizzed about his time as Newcastle's bishop between 1993 and 2005. He conceded the church's procedures for reporting child abuse allegations were inadequate. Is it right that, at least during the, if we may say, around the first half of your tenure as bishop, there was really no framework at all for dealing with allegations of child sexual assault? I think that that would be accurate, ma'am. The Commission heard allegations would only be reported to police if they were in writing. The Archbishop was also questioned over advice he'd received not to read reports or information relating to child sexual abuse. Here you are being advised to avoid obtaining information about people who hold their positions on your licence. Yes. Well, on what possible basis could that be appropriate? I don't think it's appropriate. From 1993 to 2005, Bishop Herf presided as Anglican Bishop of Newcastle, yet... That to the best of your recollection, you have no knowledge of allegations against Dean Lawrence. Yes. 
failure to recall key events, a common theme during his time on the stand. Sadly, I do not have a recollection of those conversations. I cannot recall it, ma'am. Another thing you can't recall? There are lots of things that I can recall, but this particular fact I cannot. The Commission heard he was made aware of several allegations of sexual abuse by Graham Lawrence over a number of years, admitting he should have reported the alleged abuses to police. Despite Graham Lawrence being a powerful figure in the Anglican Church, Bishop Herf today said that he was neither a member of the Gang of Three who protected him or was intimidated by him, instead saying that he had no reason to doubt Lawrence. Why do you have no recollection whatsoever of speaking with Graham Lawrence about these allegations? I have no understanding as to why that recollection hasn't come to him. Are you protecting Graham Lawrence? Certainly not. Are you intimidated by Graham Lawrence? I'm not intimidated by Graham Lawrence. When questioned about pedophile priest Peter Rushton, Roger Herft admitted he was fooled by Rushton after he was caught with pornography in his possessions. I found his whole demeanour had changed and deep in my heart I felt that he had repented, that, that somehow a change had taken place in his life. Can open admission from the man who was once the most powerful Anglican in Newcastle. I have let them down and let them down badly, let down the survivors in ways that remorse itself is a very poor emotion to even express. Bishop Roger Herft addressing the Royal Commission, accepting past wrongs. But I want to thank the Commission for holding me personally accountable. The Commission sought to gain more transparency from the former Chancellor of the Diocese, Paul Rosser QC, denying any involvement in the three-month good behaviour bond handed to Anglican priest Stephen Gray in 1990 for raping a teenage boy, despite agreeing he did sign Gray's indictment during his role as a Crown Prosecutor. That's a remarkably light sentence in your I'd have experience, so. is it not? I'd have thought so. Did you have any involvement in negotiating this sentence? No. Are you sure about that? Questioned also about the appropriateness of representing lay preacher James Brown who was charged with child sex offences. The Commission heard former Bishop Brian Farron had raised concerns with Mr Rosser over a perceived conflict of interest with his representation of James Brown. But Mr Rosser says he told Bishop Farron there wasn't one and the matter was left there. 42 years of emotion laid bare. Today, Jared McDonald stood defiant after addressing the Royal Commission. Does this help you move Oh, look at the smile on my face, darling. For more than an hour, he detailed the horrific sexual abuse he suffered at the hands of convicted pedophile priest Vincent Ryan while going to school at St Joseph's Merriweather. After every other older boy practice in 1975, before dropping me home, Father Ryan would sexually abuse me every single time. I was 10 years old. Mr McDonald spoke of the extent to which Ryan would abuse him, recalling how once he was anally raped in front of a group of boys. The boys were even made to abuse each other, driving him to a life of addiction and depression. I sat there with my legs over the edge and just thought to myself, I want to do this. I want to do this. But if I do, he wins. Fifteen more witnesses are scheduled to give evidence, including current Bishop Bill Ride. He'll appear sometime in the next few days, although this morning he released a video statement about the hearing. We support the processes of this Royal Commission that give them the opportunity to tell their stories. And we admire those who have chosen to do so. The inquiry also heard 158 people have filed claims against 31 perpetrators linked to the diocese, which has so far paid $25.7 million in compensation to victims. It's just it's, the beginning. It's just the beginning for me. The fight's just begun. The head of the Newcastle and Maitland Diocese for more than 15 years, former Bishop Michael Malone explaining that some of the child sex abuse at the hands of priests was not considered to be criminal. In, in the past, as in years ago, I think if a priest offended, 
with regard to anybody. It was regarded as a moral problem. He accepted the church's response to victims' claims was a gross neglect of duty, but was hesitant in calling it a cover-up. Cover-up's probably a word that I would not use, but um, due diligence was not followed through. Much of the Commission's focus has been on notorious pedophile priest Vince Ryan, Bishop Malone defending the church's decision to not defrock him after his release from prison. I don't think the community would have thanked us for releasing a pedophile into its midst without any, any idea of supervision or mentoring or, or the like. The face of the Catholic Church in the Hunter with the words so many abuse victims waited years to hear. As Bishop, I humbly offer an unreserved apology again on behalf of the diocese to all those men who have suffered and continue to suffer. Bishop Bill Wright giving a frank admission on the church's shortcomings at the Royal Commission into child sex abuse, particularly when it came to pedophile priest Vincent Ryan. Ryan was a sexual predator who used his status as a priest and the power that gave him uh, to gain access to boys. A statement given at a special commission of inquiry two years ago and again on the record today. Through those failures and omissions, the diocese failed to act according to the gospel. Bishop Wright told the commission that he believes more focus should be on current issues within the diocese as opposed to revisiting child sex abuse cases from decades ago. It sometimes seems that so many of the case studies are delving into matters of 30 and 40 years ago and I, I kind of wonder where the more contemporary uh, spotlight should be falling. Well, one of the issues there, Bishop, I'm sure you understand, is it takes people many, many years before they come and tell anyone yeah. that they've had a problem. Yeah. The Commission also heard of the critical work of Maureen O'Hearn, a social worker for the Diocese Victim Support Agency Zimmerman Services, work which survivors today say saved their lives. A former Catholic priest and witness in the Royal Commission, William Burston, questioned about the death of 13-year-old Andrew Nash. I didn't see it as, as having killed himself. I saw it as having, having died. You know. So you didn't even consider that he killed himself? <coughs> there didn't seem to be any indications that he had. Instead, Mr Burston described the teen's death in 1973 as a prank gone horribly wrong. Throughout the day, abuse survivors told their stories, all hauntingly similar. Brother Patrick sexually abused me on numerous occasions during that year, but I always wore a tight belt, so he was never able to get his hand right down inside my pants. Former Director of Professional Standards, Brother Alexis Turton, also called as a witness. Brother Turton told the Commission several brothers had admitted to him they'd committed an offence, estimating around 10 people over a 15-year period. When he was asked to provide the names of those who'd come forward, he could offer only two. Can we give the brother a pen and paper if you'd write the names down of people who admitted to you that they'd committed an offence? You mean... I'm not quite sure I understand, Your Honour. At 90 years of age, Georgery Nash is still struggling with the pain caused by child sexual abuse. About six months after the Bar Beach accident, on October the 8th, 1974, Andrew took his own life in his bedroom. He was 13. Ms Nash's son Andrew was a student at Morris Brothers in Hamilton. He had visited the beach, which it's since been revealed was a regular haunt of convicted pedophile Brother Romuald. I now believe that Andrew was sexually abused and that he took his own life because of it. Ms Nash told the Commission on the night of Andrew's death she was visited by three brothers who on several occasions asked about Andrew's behaviour, whether he had mentioned anything or left a note. It was the last time she heard from them. I also believe the reason that brothers Romuald, Christopher and John came to our home the night of Andrew's death 
was to try and find out if there was any evidence that Andrew left behind in relation to the abuse, such as a note. Earlier, brother Alexis Turton was asked to indicate which Marist brothers he'd spoken to about allegations of child sex abuse and who had admitted committing child sex abuse. Do you know how many you marked with a D? Sorry, I didn't count, Your Honour. All right, we'll count them. There's 10 that have been marked with an A. Broken and vulnerable. Um. <coughs> and a survivor. Scott Hallett, an image of resilience and strength, still standing after years of child abuse at the hands of Father Vince Ryan. Father Ryan stole my innocence. Aged just nine years at the time, Mr Hallett told of the abuse committed while he was an altar boy and the haunting impact. The abuse has affected my ability to relate to, relate to other people. The abuse has affected my career opportunities. Um, I have been diagnosed as suicidal with depression, anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. Mr Hallett calling for understanding, not pity, for abuse survivors. Have a look at you or yourself or your kids when they were nine years old and read a couple of statements and just try and put yourself in our position. Earlier, brother Michael Hill spoke of brother Dominic and the complaints made against him by former students at Marist Brothers at Hamilton. What was the nature of the complaints? I'm not aware, uh, inappropriate behaviour, but there are no more details than that. Did, Did you, you ask him? Is no, there any more details? No. Um, when you concerned to know? Absolutely. In a letter from Mr Hill to a church lawyer, he compared allegations of child sex abuse against Brother Patrick to a well-known Hollywood film. Former principal of Hamilton Maris Brothers, Christopher Way, told the commission he received what he thought at the time was an admission by Brother Romuald back in the 1970s that he had sexually abused boys in the past. But Brother Wade didn't report the matter to police. The 80-year-old labelling Brother Romyold as an imposing, strong and intimidating character. Not for the first time, this Royal Commission. I don't recall. I couldn't exactly recall, Your Honour. I don't recall, Your Honour. An authority figure unable to remember allegations of inappropriate behaviour. I can't recall conversations from that far, that far back. Former Marist Brothers principal, Brother Christopher Wade, was responding to claims he knew why 13-year-old abuse victim Andrew Nash committed suicide in 1974. You were relieved that Andrew had told nobody before he died? That's not true. And you were relieved because in your mind the problem had gone away? That's not true. And when Brother Romuald moved schools two months later, you were even more relieved because he was no longer your problem? That's not true. And you're pretending that you don't remember that evening because you're a coward and you're a liar. That's not true. Brother, did you cover up allegations of child sex abuse whilst you were principal? The current Maris Brothers Provincial today acknowledged the pain caused and offered an emotional invitation to survivors to come forward. I know that a lot of them have suffered terribly. And... Um, <clears throat> We want to do what we can. And after more than 40 years of pain for the family of Andrew Nash, today brother Peter Carroll announced Maris Brothers have already begun a separate inquiry into the 13-year-old suicide. It's very satisfying because now I know for sure. Meanwhile, Commissioner Peter McClellan acknowledged the media's role in sparking the inquiry, particularly the Newcastle Herald's Joanne McCarthy. Without those efforts, it's unlikely that this Royal Commission would have taken place. A place of worship and today also a place of healing. For a church humbled and hurting. I think people are bewildered, shocked and surprised by uh, the material that has been revealed. Special Eucharist marking the start of the church's recovery process from the Royal Commission and its revelations of abuse. We're absolutely committed to making sure that people are safe and know they are safe in our churches. And from internal unrest, this letter tabled at the Commission and questioning Bishop Greg Thompson's handling of being an abuse victim himself resulted in the diocese dissolving the parish council. 
The Cathedral Board has now taken over responsibility from the Parish Council following its sacking amid revelations in the Royal Commission. Despite the internal turmoil, the Anglican Diocese maintains there is still confidence within the church. The um, diocesan community uh, have gathered on a number of occasions in recent weeks and showed that they are firmly behind Bishop Thompson. But religion sociologist Dr Kathleen McPhillips has questioned whether that same confidence remains outside the church following the commission. I think there has been a real problem with the way that the church is perceived in, in um, the broader community. We don't presume that the broader community is simply going to accept our word. We want them to see our action because we know that our actions will speak louder than our words. Once the most powerful member of the Anglican Church in Newcastle, Brian Farron, says he was under attack from within. Well, they, they, were, they were out to get me. The Bishop today told the Royal Commission of hostile and vigorous attempts by senior Anglicans to bring him down. I got this anonymous text on my phone saying, have a great holiday, come back and resign. It came after Bishop Farron took action against priests over child sex allegations. It's fair to say that you had a pretty difficult time during your tenure as a bishop. That a bishop I did, of had a terrible time. The Commission also heard claim supporters of former Dean Graham Lawrence were front and centre. You're punishing Bishop Farron for bringing these allegations out into the light of day. I'm not punishing for that, I'm punishing for the way it happened. Former diocesan solicitor Robert Caddies was among several who complained against Bishop Farron. He took issue with making public the belief the late father Peter Rushton was a child sex offender. He brought the diocese into disrepute by claiming that father Peter Rushton was a serial child abuser. We now know that that's probably right and I, I don't... I, I, I don't think we knew that at the time. Caddy's expressed disappointment over the 2012 defrocking of his good friend, the former Dean of Newcastle, Graham Lawrence. He claimed due process wasn't followed and Lawrence wasn't provided with legal aid. Caddy's, along with several others, helping fund an appeal in the courts. Still clearly moved some six years after coming face to face with an abuse survivor. I can still visualise the meeting. Um, it was a pretty traumatic menu for me. Bishop Brian Farron close to tears at the Royal Commission as he recounted his 2010 meeting with CKA. CKA had previously told the Commission he was abused by a priest in the 1970s while he was an altar boy. That priest is now being investigated by police. I had to excuse myself at one stage because I was really so upset. Uh, anyhow, um, I heard his story and... Um, uh, I apologised. Giving evidence for a second day, he also described the backlash for his handling of abuse allegations within the church. Bishop Farron detailed a 2012 meeting with the abuse survivor known as CKH. Immediately after, he announced he would be defrocking the former Dean of Newcastle, Graham Lawrence, over allegations of child sexual abuse. Following the move, though, the commission was told Farron was the subject of around nine complaints all of which were dismissed by the Episcopal Standards Board. The now retired bishop standing firm when questioned yet again over his relationship with Lawrence. I was the bishop of the diocese. Uh, I, had, I, had, I had authority. I was certainly not intimidated by him. And I'd shown that I wasn't intimidated by any of these people by going and facing them. I'd gone to the congregation at, at Cook's Hill. I'd gone and faced the people at Terrigal. I'd faced the people at the cathedral. I had never stayed away from the cathedral. I faced those people. I, I was never intimidated by them. Forgetful and at times uncomfortable. Are you getting irritated with me, Mr. No, Lawrence? I'm not getting irritated with you. Former priest Graham Lawrence giving evidence at the Royal Commission, denying he protected pedophile priests during his time as Dean of Newcastle Cathedral. Is it right or is it wrong that you were a go-to person in the diocese for <coughs> priests who were accused of child sexual abuse? That is wrong. 
Lawrence was stripped of his holy orders in 2012 after allegations of child sex abuse were levelled against him, as well as claims he was part of a gang of three within the diocese which kept allegations of child sex abuse secret. Claims he denies. In a heated afternoon of evidence, Lawrence said former Newcastle Bishop Roger Herft never raised child sex abuse allegations with him. At one point, he even suggested efforts by police to contact him about allegations against a priest were a hoax. Are you seriously suggesting in your evidence today that you thought this telephone call was some kind of hoax? Yes. That's just not believable, is it, I'm Mr sorry, Lawrence? I'm it's true, ma'am. And despite his defrocking occurring back in 2012, there still remains elements within the diocese which are critical of Graham Lawrence's removal. The current Assistant Bishop of Newcastle, Peter Stewart, today labelling those elements as virulent and harsh. Church circles. I never had to work with a group that is as difficult and as intractable and as hurtful as this group of people. Resuming his evidence in the chair, growing increasingly agitated. You're getting quite a tone there, Mr no, Lawrence. Are you getting a, a bit irritated? Because we've been through this already once. Today's fiery questioning began with why defrocked priest Graham Lawrence failed to report church deacon Andrew Duncan's alleged pedophilia. It was an alleged misbehaviour. But for the most part, focused on his relationship with an abuse victim known as CKH. You were pursuing a sexual relationship with CKH in 1984, weren't you? I was not. And you had been for some years, had you not? I was not. That's contrary to CKH's evidence. However, he did admit he'd sent him a card on his 18th birthday featuring an image of a penis. So you accept you sent this card to him? Yes. This card that says, thank heavens for little boys? Yes, a quote out of a song. Earlier today, former Assistant Bishop Richard Appleby continued giving evidence, this time over the phone from London. Since first appearing in August, the Royal Commission has examined a number of his diaries from the period of his tenure. They've proved that some of his previous assertions were wrong. In particular, that he had met with a victim known as CKA about the abuse he'd experienced. Um, my only possible excuse is that I've always been someone who reads by scanning, and I've never, for example, I've never been, had the skills of being a proofreader. With a, a careless mistake, it's one I should not have made, um, and I'm acutely embarrassed, and I apologise unreservedly to the Commission for it. After 16 days of hearings, current Bishop Greg Thompson, himself an abuse survivor, had his chance to give evidence. It's the case that there has been a very significant problem with child sexual abuse in the Diocese of Newcastle. Systemic over many decades. While forced to stand due to back pain, it was the suffering of abuse victims that was foremost on the Bishop's mind. Barker said, Greg, if you want to get into ministry, we have to have a relationship through his body language, Barker left me in no doubt that when he said I would have to have a relationship with him, that I would have to have a sexual relationship with him. Since going public as a survivor last year, Bishop Thompson told the Commission he's been the victim of a campaign against his leadership. I felt shamed. Public. Public shame. Rocked by the revelations tabled in this inquiry, the Newcastle Diocese will now undergo a number of independent reviews, including one by a former police commander into its policies and practice to try and restore confidence and trust. The house is burning. We need a national response. We need resolution and resolve from our bishops. In the end, it's hearts and minds. And until we have hearts and minds convinced that child safety is of the highest order and that those who have suffered need to have proper redress, change will be slow. For other abuse victims, Bishop Thompson has been a rock during the hearings, something clear as he left the stand today. If there's a way for there to be continuity of the professionals who are involved in those matters, then I think we will go a long way towards making things better for, for survivors. It's taken almost three years. Australia's most senior Catholic cleric accused of covering up child sexual abuse, finally on trial. Are you looking forward to having your time in court? 
Archbishop of Adelaide, Philip Wilson, appearing in court for the first time since being charged in March 2015, forced to brave the media gauntlet in Newcastle. Archbishop, how are you feeling? His trial was set to begin last week, but his legal team argued he was suffering from Alzheimer's and wasn't mentally fit, but a neuropsychologist ruled otherwise. Wilson stands accused of failing to report the sexual assault of a boy by pedophile priest James Fletcher in the 1970s in the Hunter Valley. DPP barrister Gareth Harrison telling the local court when the boy told Wilson back in 1976 he said he couldn't believe Fletcher would do such things and that the accused said he would pass the information on to the parish priest. But he went on to say it's the Crown case that at no time prior to the death of Father Fletcher did the accused report what he had been told to the police. Wilson's barrister told the court the main issue in the trial is not whether the abuse by Father James Fletcher took place, but rather what the Archbishop was told by his victim some 30 years ago. The first witness is set to give evidence tomorrow. He arrived a powerful and respected member of the Catholic Church. Archbishop, how are you feeling? But moments later, Archbishop of Adelaide, Philip Wilson, emerged a convicted criminal. How are you feeling after being found guilty? The 67-year-old remained silent, just like he did back in 1976, when he was told by then altar boy Peter Cray of the abuse he'd suffered at the hands of convicted pedophile priest James Fletcher in the Hunter Valley. It's a very, very significant day. In his ruling, Magistrate Stone found that in 1971, Fletcher indecently assaulted the then 11-year-old Cray, and in 1976, he did in fact tell the Archbishop of the abuse, but between 2014 and 2016, Wilson failed to tell police. Do you still stand by your version of events? The magistrate ruled Wilson remembered what he'd been told. He must have believed it, but wanted to protect the church and its image. What's the message to come from this, do you think? Look, I think it's they, um, they should all be made accountable, those that had the knowledge and, and, and didn't do a thing. Daniel Feenan was just one person who fell victim to Fletcher's abuse. Knowing now that he knew in 1976 when, when I was born at the Martyr Hospital in Newcastle, if Wilson had done something, he would never have got to me. Wilson has already made three appeals in three years. The first in Newcastle local court in February 2016, then in October before the Supreme Court, and then in June 2017 in the New South Wales Court of Appeal. It's not yet clear whether he'll fight the guilty verdict. He deserves to go to jail. Reporter Tyson Cottrell joins us now live. Tyson, when will Archbishop Wilson be sentenced? Paul, Archbishop Wilson will return to court here in Newcastle on the 19th of June where a sentence date will be set. But the prosecution has already indicated that it will seek to have Wilson taken into custody on that occasion and will also be pushing for a full-time custodial sentence. The maximum penalty which can be imposed is two years jail. Paul? Tyson Cottrell reporting there. Paul, Archbishop Wilson will return to court here in Newcastle on the 19th of June where a sentence date will be set. But the prosecution has already indicated that it will seek to have Wilson taken into custody on that occasion and will also be pushing for a full-time custodial sentence. The maximum penalty which can be imposed is two years jail.